Brilliant. Thank you so much, Laura. Thank you very much. Um, well, I'm Paul Edmonds from a company called Cornerstone and Partners. Um, we're a management consultancy business, but um, I'm a big fan of Bitter. Um, and what we're going to be talking to uh, to everybody today is introducing John from John Manning from Arthur Ellis. Um, I've known John for I don't know, it's quite a few years now. Ten, maybe. Ten Getting years. Closer, yeah. Though. Yeah, Getting on too long, way. too long. Yeah. Um, Arthur Ellis, as an organisation, are, are a member of Bitter, and John, in particular, is a kind of uh, has been a friend to Bitter and Bitter X. Uh, John very kindly did one of the original events with Bitter X, where he came out and actually did a, an event where we actually were allowed to meet people, which was which was fantastic. Talked about his own personal journey, which was incredibly impactful for everybody in the room. So. Um, so I'm here just to introduce John. Um, so Arthur Ellis is an organization started about three years ago, so still relatively new. They have 30 people working in the team. Uh, John will, will build on that slightly. Um, they work with schools, they work with large corporates, they work with lots of us SMEs, I guess. Um, John is a fellow of the RSA and he's spoken at Cambridge uh, Union, very well thought of. Uh, he's got his own radio show, or I think a guest on a radio show in Milton Keynes. So, um, so his voice and the way that he does business is being communicated across many, many channels. So I've, I've always thoroughly enjoyed working with him. Um, that is all I'm going to say about you, John. Uh, otherwise, go straight <laughs> to you. If you can add anything on top of that before I ask, throw in a few questions at you. Yeah, yeah you, you're right. Usually it's just my voice. So people, unfortunately, have got the... Uh, the unfortunate is staring at my face for a little while. Um, so usually it's just the voice, but yeah, the, my, my views, I suppose, on mental health are relatively unique. Um, so I've been asked to, to share what they are quite a bit over the last few years. And um, Arthur Ellis yeah, started about three years ago and, and it was mainly to tackle the issues surrounding what, what develops with, um, with mental health. Usually they are, just shone a light on rather than solved. Um, that's what awareness has kind of done. And we've seen mental health issues escalate over the last 12 years or so. So really we wanted to develop, um, develop solutions around it. So set to work about three years ago on doing that. And yeah, like you said, we're, we're now a team of 30 um, working all across the country and we're, we've set up a group of businesses. So we are actually, um, in a, in a group where we work with corporates in, in one area of the business and work with schools and we work with uh, within our training and all of that sort of stuff. But then that feeds uh, and, and revenue, we, we donate directly into a social enterprise so that we can build an accessible mental health service for children and young people across the country. So we've got around 400 clients in that area now that the businesses that we're working with are supporting uh, to actually access help where it might not be accessed elsewhere. Fantastic. Um, uh, John's going to unpack a little bit more on some of the kind of strategies that maybe you'd want to employ or at least consider when you're um, in a business. Uh, can I ask you with a, a very simple question to kick off with? Mm. So the definition of well-being, how, how would you at Arthur Ellis define that? Yeah, so some of the, some of the people who work with us is... Um, are within clinical psychology. Some of them got master's degrees coming out of their ears. So I've, I've covered it an awful lot with them, just like how do you actually define it? And, and well-being is, um, is our state of being comfortable, happy and healthy. Okay. So it's not necessarily just from day to day, it's throughout our entire lives, how we behave, our lifestyles, everything that's contributing towards us feeling comfortable, happy and, and ultimately being healthy. Okay, and so just um, you now the elephant in the room is obviously we're going through a bit of a difficult time at the moment. Um, so just as a comparison, also I'd love to know how you've seen things evolve in the last six months. But what what does today look like compared to seven months ago? What is the big difference you've seen? Yeah, seven months ago it was. It's interesting because we, we've got quite a unique position of working with big corporates, but then also working with individual people and communities through the different businesses Arthur Ellis is made up of. So we can see 
the impact that the last seven months has had on individual people in different situations, in different uh, from different backgrounds and, and in different circumstances. Um, we've also seen it on businesses and, and back in March, February, a lot of businesses in particular were focused on raising awareness and breaking down stigma and um, it's absolutely right to do that. But now what we've seen is the transition into needing to have services in place and needing to have um, different things in place rather than just rather than just talking about it. It needs to go a step further. Um, yeah. Before lockdown, the access to mental health services was, was quite poor. Um, so people, even if they did reach out, and in the last few years, running up to the beginning of this year, referrals into mental health services went up about 300% across the country. Um, and that's what awareness had done. You know, people were talking about it, it was working. But without the services in place, waiting lists and access to support can extend for up to two years um, waiting for an appointment. So really the, the need for it to, uh, to be actionable and it to be solution-based has really accelerated. And the use for digital technology was, we work with quite a few digital firms and um, one of them said that technology has advanced uh, for about five years the, the, the rate that it was. So we're five years more advanced now than we were with technology. So we've had to adopt that. And a lot of people are adopting that in order to gain support. Yeah, it's interesting, you, you and I were talking offline before about that the, the calls to domestic abuse lines had gone up like 700%. Mm. So you're seeing, you're seeing something very similar um, as far as people reaching out and asking for help. Yeah, the it's not necessarily just the, the the amount of people reaching out has has gone up. So in March, in our one to one service, we had we we began gaining as many referrals that we would see in a month in in one day. So it, it went up sort of you know thirty fold really. Um, and it's not necessarily just the amount of of issues that people are experiencing, but it's also the the severity of what people are experiencing as well has, has gone up an awful lot. So we're, um, we're not necessarily just seeing uh, more issues, but it, they're, they're worse issues as well. And they're not being, they're, they're coming to us because they're not being picked up elsewhere. Um, so I don't think the, the infrastructure in the country uh, and the way that we're dealing with it is equipped to be able to deal with the, the severity of issues. So that's why we need more solutions focus. No, and I know you're going to unpack some of these things a bit later on, um, and I don't want to dwell too much on the stigma that goes along with this. But you know, from a personal point of view, you know, I, we're all in the same boat. I, I lost a lot of my clients, um, you know, a few months back and what have you. And there definitely were a few days where there was a bit of a wobble going on about exactly what the world could look like. Um, getting back into the workplace and physically. Now I'm working from home, I did before, so that's not a big issue for me, but for some people who have been out of that workspace and now are having to face the, the reality that their employers are asking them to go back in, what does that look like and what is, what is that creating, what worry is that creating in those people? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, and I was speaking to a business we support down in London and they were, they were saying that they're having trouble getting their employees back into the office but if they invite them to the pub, then they'll go. Um, and it's quite interesting to see this different dynamic. And, and the way that well-being is typically structured, which I'll go into more later on, but we all have these things. And in psychology, they're called protective factors. So we all have things built around our lives that are called protective factors. And they're things that we do that protect the different um, structures of well-being that we've built up in our lives. So a couple of examples would be brushing our teeth. We don't really think about it. It's just something that we do. Um, but that protects our health. It goes towards protecting our health. It's also exercise and different things. So all of these behaviours that we have are called protective factors. And if we, um, if we experience something like you said about maybe losing some clients or hitting a change in our lives, yeah. um, however stressful that might be, it could be moving house or going through a divorce or something like that. 
we all experience different things like that and it impacts our protective factors or our ability to do them okay. so sometimes they can get replaced with more negative behaviors which are called maintenance factors um, the word maintenance can be a little bit misleading but it maintains the state that you're in so if you look at the symptoms of something like depression where the typical symptoms would be maybe staying in bed feeling lethargic um, not wanting to communicate with people, maybe isolating yourself. Those symptoms can be seen as maintenance behaviors. They will keep you in that cycle of depression. So protective factors are there to break that cycle and to get you out of it. So what we've seen through lockdown and with people working from home and people, um, people having more time on their hands from not commuting, for example, they've been able to focus on their protective factors a lot more and focus on things that are positive for their well-being, like walking, spending time either online with friends or going for walks with people. Um, the amount of people walking has been ridiculous. I don't know if anyone's been, been out uh, just to their local park or something, but everybody's been outside. It's been really wonderful. We've been lucky with the time of year that it's fallen in. So everybody's been able to, if we, if we look at it in this way, that people have been able to enhance and spend time on their positive behaviors, then the risk of going back to work for the individual, for the, the staff, is that these protective factors won't be maintained, they won't be upheld. So there's a risk of maintenance factors coming in. And it's, it's quite subconscious for a lot of people, people don't really think about it in this way, but that's what happens. So it's, it's I wouldn't say that there are people who are worried about the virus and, and worried about their health but in a lot of cases we're seeing it that more more people are concerned about their lifestyle that may change instead okay that's that's excellent um with my with my business hat on um yeah. <laughs> we look we look at um you know if you're running a business you've got a lot of people working for you you've got to look at the implications of um, investing time into this and doing it properly um, and, I'm, and I said trying to put to one side just the human aspect which is the reason we should do it what are the implications if we don't do this when I'm weighing that up what is the kind of without being horrible what is the ROI of, of not or doing this yeah it's um, it's difficult sometimes to build a business case especially because uh, it's relatively new, you know, well-being in business is relatively new. So people see it as being quite a fluffy thing sometimes, but it does have a, a real commercial benefit. And it, it obviously depends on how you do it and how you go about it. You've got to be evidence based with it. And if you can look at it in terms of the individual people and structuring it in the way of those protective factors and, and yeah. stuff. Um, but it's interesting because I, I've looked way back at since you know, mental health awareness and everything started to, to come onto the market. So that started around 2007, where the government sort of thought we should really do something about this. Um, so they started to put some money into mental health awareness and running some campaigns around it to get people talking more. By 2012, um, there, was about and, there was about 100 million pounds spent on raising awareness of, of mental health. Um, in mm. contrast to that, it's very i'm not i'm not saying anything but there might be some conspiracy theorists out there who, who can see a, a pattern but the mental health services across the country within the nhs had their funding reduced by 105 million so there was all of this awareness being raised but there was less services in order to cope with the people reaching out so what we saw was everybody talking about it and like i said referrals went up into the services 300 percent or so but there wasn't anyone there to be able to help and the, the really restricted funds so that led to people needing to deal with it on their own. So how that impacts a business at the time. So in around 2014, the impact to businesses was about 26 billion per year in, in, in the private sector. Wow. That equates to about, I think it's 1,056 pounds per head in a business. Um, so that's from people being off sick, uh, about 95% of people lie when they're off sick with mental health issues they'll say that it's a tummy bug or they've got a cough or whatever um so only about five percent of people are actually honest with their employer why they're off um and then they find out after the fact 
about 300,000 people, the, the figures for this was around 2017, around 300,000 people left their jobs because of it um, in that year. So all of this contributes towards having that, that figure per head. So that was back in 2014. Now with the lack of services and the lack of solutions there, but awareness is still being raised, um, we have, uh, we've looked at the different figures going on out there and we estimate that it's gone up to around 1,304 rather than 1,056. So it's gone up by, what's that, about 25% um, because there haven't been solutions in place. So if a business of 1,000 employees uh, they could estimate that it's costing them about 1.3 million or so, 1.4 million. Um, and there's these two elements of absenteeism and presenteeism. Presenteeism is being at work, but not really being there and maybe making silly mistakes because you're not thinking straight or something like that. Um, presenteeism costs businesses twice as much as people being signed off. Um, but the issue is that if people are signed off, they don't focus on protective factors. They'll focus on maintenance factors, staying in bed and doing all of this stuff that adds to their condition. And I, and I, I imagine if somebody in a particular team is not um, on their A game, not performing as they, that's going to have a knock on effect to everybody around them as well. So it's not just one person that's underperforming. Yeah. It's, it's going to be a, um, a team, a team problem. Yeah, absolutely. And if, if you look at, um, we've all we've all worked in a team where we've had to carry someone. Yeah. Um, I'm sure you have, Paul. Like I said, yeah, we, I work, we I work with you, John, so. yeah, <laughs> you still work together. So you, you <laughs> I know that you have. Um, <laughs> so there's if we if we look at it in the way of protective factors, and throughout an entire day, not necessarily just a working day, but from from waking up to going to sleep, you've got a, you've got a certain amount of time to do things that are suitable and um, that are going to have a positive impact on your well-being. Yeah. If there's something going on in work where someone isn't performing as well uh, and then you have to pick that up, maybe you've got to work a little bit later or maybe you've got to work through your lunch break or something like that, that takes away from your protective factors. Yeah. Um, so it's not necessarily that that's going to have an impact on your mental health and well-being but it's also going to have an impact on the way that you're, you're processing thoughts towards that member in the team. Yeah. Um, yeah. If a business is getting in the way of somebody's protective factors, that that's where people can start becoming quite resentful, <coughs> motivated, all of these different things towards either that individual in the team that they're having to carry or the business as a whole. You're, you're making so much sense. Um, it's, it's sounding so much clearer and more black and white which is what as you were saying earlier on with what is typically seen as a kind of woolly, woolly topic. Um, so that as being as it is, what kind of strategies do you feel that um, an organization, even like mine, where would I, where would I start on that process? What would you, what would you be recommending? Well, yeah. And, and to be honest, keeping it as simple as possible. Um, because I've heard about loads of different businesses trying to implement uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs and all of these different um, very good structures, but they tend to work for individuals more than a population. So you, businesses are a population, even though you know we want to treat everybody as individuals and all of that sort of stuff. Business have a finite amount of things that they can do. Um, there was a few surveys done across the UK about you know, what do, where do people see the responsibility lying for their mental health? 50% um, of the population believe it's at the workplace. Um, the rest of it is healthcare providers, the government, uh, the individual themselves. So businesses do have a part to play, but I think sometimes it can be quite frightening that businesses think that they need to turn into clinicians or they need to turn into doctors, but it's not necessarily, it's definitely not the case. So the way in which businesses can have a, a positive impact is to structure well-being in an appropriate way. And well-being is, is broken down and these protective factors I've spoken about and these positive behaviours people engage in in their lives, they break down into five areas. So that is um, social connection, so how we connect with people. It is being active, so physically being active. Um, it is giving. 
So not necessarily donating things, but giving your time, your knowledge, your expertise, that sort of thing. It's taking notice. So that's not necessarily mindfulness, but it's being present and in the moment and having methodologies in order to help you become present and in the moment. Um, and then there's one more. I can't remember what I've said already. Uh, yeah. yeah, Being active, uh, giving time, which I think is just fantastic. I think um, that in itself is something that we probably could do more of in and outside work. So I think it's very yeah. valuable. Um, taking notice, you talk. Um, yes, and, and, uh, and learning as well. So ongoing learning. And, and that is sometimes businesses put um, learning and development. It's, in, it's within HR, but it's not often seen as something suitable for well-being or built into right. the well-being strategy. So how are our people learning? But it's not necessarily purely about having everybody learning all the time, but it's also not frightening people away from learning and allowing people to make mistakes. Um, yeah. You've got to make mistakes in order to find out what works. So it's about developing a culture that allows that and doing different, um, different practices and different things for that. The, uh, the, 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 these five kind of pillars you're talking about, <clears throat> if anybody who's interested, these are available for free on, on the Arthur Ellis website. But just, just can I just go back? You talk about kind of social connectedness. Yep. Um, by, by definition, if somebody is not in a good place, they're normally moving away from everybody. And that's the last place they want to do is so that you're talking more about if you recognize that in someone else, that we're making connections um, and getting, getting closer to people. Or, or are you saying it from the other way around? You're asking somebody who is vulnerable to, to reach out a bit more it's well from a business's point of view it's about setting it's facilitating an appropriate amount of social connection between your teams so it's it's really interesting that that we we encourage people to connect whereas sometimes it can be detrimental so bear with me on that because it is very important and loneliness is a real issue but some people it can it can too much connection can make them unwell so by, by looking at that in a slightly different way, you can begin to structure how your people connect with each other. Um, and it's not necessarily reaching out if something's bad. That's, that's quite a reactive way to, to look at things. And, and the way that, that we need to start moving away from that is to become a lot more proactive. And we, we have an improved program. So we work in ways that's consistently improving mental health and well-being. So by working in that way, you're setting up the way that people could to connect in order to contribute to their well-being. So that does vary between teams. And it usually benchmarks off of how uh, extroverted or introverted people are. So if people are extroverted, if they do have a wobble or they become unwell, this is very generic. It's not necessarily play by play for everybody, but if you're looking at just setting out a structure, if you have teams that are focused on sales and marketing, for example, very people focused, they're gonna to wanna to connect more than other people. If you are working in software development, um, for example, or engineering, typically those people are a little bit more uh, introverted. So social connection is gonna be much more uh, exhausting for them. So they're going to want to let, they want to connect a lot less. So there's no point in having exactly the same structure for the same two teams, the different types of people. We do loads of psychometrics and that sort of thing to figure it out. Um, we've developed an assessment that helps businesses figure out and figure out how uh, their teams think. But one of the, the things with extroverts is that they will be very engaging and they'll be maybe the loudest in the room at meetings and flood all of their ideas out, respond to feedback, all of that sort of stuff. So it's very there and then. Introverts are probably the quieter ones in the meeting, but they're very analytical and they're very really reflective. They are, their, their mind is going 100 mile an hour, even if their, their mouth isn't. So they will be a lot more tired after social events or after connecting with people and they need a lot more time within the pillar of taking notice, for example. So it's about getting the ratios right. Yeah, and I'm, I'm guessing these, these five, pillars or principles, I guess, are 
they're not just to cope with people going back to work now. These are ongoing lifestyle things that businesses should be thinking about ongoing. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. So this is one thing that um, I, I talk about quite regularly is that the world isn't necessarily structured for well-being. Um, you know, we, we all rush around and we all uh, are, are thriving for more and businesses are thriving for more, which rightly they should. But if you're doing that, then it becomes very short lived. And that's what we're seeing. People are becoming unwell because of this lifestyle. So there's something called a thrive model. And the thrive model is, if you imagine kind of a, a thermometer where it's green at the bottom, amber, and it gets closer to red. So green at the bottom is your absolute fundamentals that, that you should be doing, whether you're unwell or not, or whether you're experiencing issues or not by by making sure that's consistent, which a lot of people struggle to do and, and a lot of businesses don't do, you're putting yourself at risk of not being as capable to deal with change or being, being in a good place enough to be able to adapt with any situations that come up. If you are, and I know that a lot of businesses do look at um, building resilience and doing resilience things, if you have these things right, people will naturally be more resilient anyway. Um, because they have what they need in place in order to cope with different issues that come up. One of the things that you can have a look at mental illness being is coping strategies. So if people develop a mental health issue, it's more than likely because they've found different coping strategies to deal with the situation that they're in. So if they've got positive ones anyway in their lifestyle and in their life, they're more <laughs> likely to, to, to resort to those anyway. Oh, that's very good. That's very good. Uh, just would, would you mind just unpacking a little bit more when you talk about taking notice? What do you mean by that? So, yeah, take, taking notice is about being present and being reflective. So it's having an opportunity to reflect on. Um, in some ways, it pairs with learning as well, because you can you can reflect on how you dealt with situations. You can see how you um, how well you did, what could have been improved all of those sorts of things but especially take, taking notice is especially effective with things like anxiety um, something like social anxiety disorder for example uh, a lot of people think that mindfulness is very helpful for anxiety but clinically it's actually not recommended um, it's one of the it's, it's specifically noted in manuals and different um, in different uh, well they're manuals and Big books. Okay. <laughs> I, I really, uh, we have, but I don't sit there and read them all the time. I'm not that, not that geeky. Um, but, but mindfulness for anxiety is specifically not recommended when someone is experiencing an anxious situation. So anxiety stems from a situation or being confronted with a situation that we have um, maybe not come across before or it's in the future, it's uncertain. So we develop different thought processes around what could happen, what's the outcome going to be, all of these different things. That's typically, those thoughts typically stem from our past experiences. So if we've been made redundant five times in our life and we get called into the office all of a sudden, that's where our mind goes. That stems yeah. Yeah. So something like taking notice is uh, if, if people are anxious, rather than things like mindfulness and you're having all of those different thoughts, the last place you want to be is in your mind. It's not very helpful. Yeah. So what you need instead is something called grounding. You need to be grounded and that's bringing you back into the present. So you're not worried about the future issue or the future situation. You're, you're focused on the present moment. So, um, so there are loads of different grounding techniques that you can, um, that you can build into your working practices, but it's more about building the, um, if you can build, build reflective uh, methodologies into your practices. And you can do this just by small tweaks to the way that you review things, the way that you have your meetings, the way that you provide feedback, you can do that. So rather than focusing on what's in the mind, you focus on what's in the present. So that's kind of the, the pillar of taking notice. And it goes towards learning uh, as well. Okay, well, I, I can highly recommend um, that every looks at those five pillars on your site because I think it would help after this event just to go through them one at a time. Um, got a couple of questions come through if I can. Um, yeah, sure, yeah. 
Um, the, I'm not going to say who, who these are from, uh, just for their own uh, privacy, but uh, somebody who's got a team of 10, so small, small business. Um, my team aren't taking time off, but sometimes I think they've left their brains at home. I, I will tell you that I go into companies all the time. The amount of companies and people I work with who are saying exactly the same thing, mm. um, I'll read on. Sometimes I think they've left their brains in bed. How do you introduce a program without people feeling singled out? That they aren't a particular sociable bunch. Um, they're data analysts, so we're going to work out who this is now. So they yeah. aren't the type of people that would normally put their hands up and say, "Listen, um, I'm okay to talk about this. Let's all get in a room and cuddle together." So yeah, how would you how would you approach that challenge? So introducing something. Let me just make sure that I've got it right. It's quite a long question. Can't see it. Um, so it's a small team of ten. They're they're data analysts. So they they'll probably I don't, obviously this is general but they, they'll probably fall into the introverted thing that we spoke about earlier on um, so they're probably not likely to to reach out they'll probably be quite quiet in meetings so the connecting needs to be quite small one of the things that you can do um, and one thing that, that we've got to build in with our well-being structures is making sure that whatever we build in can also contribute to the other pillars so with this particular team, what I would suggest is because they are introverted, the thing is with um, them having meetings or, or taking things on board, they'll be over analytical. So I can understand where that worry comes from of they're going to suss me out and they're going to know what I'm trying to do. Um, so there's, a, there's, there's one way of doing it, which is just being completely open and expressing your concerns to the team as to what's happening but there's also other ways that you can do it through different activities and different exercises so when people are introverted and we've seen it before with a, a software business it was a slightly larger team i think it was about 90 people and they had um, they had a lot of data engineers data analysts software engineers in there as well um, when they were receiving feedback or when they were in meetings they wouldn't be talking, they would be analysing and they would be looking at what people are saying, looking at what people are doing. And that's fine. But the issue with it was that the thoughts that they were having, they were taking home with them. And they were, you know, they were, it was impacting their sleep, they were becoming intrusive, they were overthinking all of these different things. That led to quite a few issues and negative ways in, in which to do these things. So one of the issues with that is that introverted people tend to be less assertive. So they'll be a lot more passive. They will just take on information and they'll, they'll just deal with it by themselves with these intrusive thoughts. So one thing for that particular team that will probably be helpful is to build up their assertiveness. So the way that you can do that is by focusing on different activities in your connect bubble um, where you are engaging the team in providing each other feedback and helping them to, uh, you can kind of make it a game where you're uh, competing to, uh, to be the first person that speaks out. Um, so something like, I don't know, like charades, for example, where you've got to you know, stay out different things and, and be assertive to get your point across while someone's trying to do something. It can be fun. It doesn't have to be, let's sit down and talk about mental health. But that, that impact can have a real good knock-on effect to how they deal as a team moving forward. And it, yeah. it, not, not that it's under a cloak or anything like that, or you know, you're not misleading them or, or trying to manipulate them, but that's the area that that particular team will need to develop. And doing activities <laughs> that will naturally develop it without sitting them down and talking to them about mental health. No. So you, you know, you can be inventive with it. And so. I, I, I definitely can resonate with that question and the fact that, you know, when you go into a company and you need to talk about a subject that's needed in the team, but the moment you bring it up, the person that's needing it most probably yeah. realises they're being singled out of me. And so even, even the subject of, um, came to mind, you know, self-awareness, then getting everybody together to talk about self-awareness and go, John, talk about self-awareness. When already we're pointing you out for that reason, so I think finding giving giving teams information, getting everybody to talk about a subject, and making it completely across the board. Everybody's there if they want to talk about it, or or even be part of the 
um, the training in a way, mm. giving their opinions on things, I think is, has, has always worked very well in other areas as well. Um, just one more question here. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, someone else has been setting up a team and actually um, introducing some mental health first aid training. Yep. Um, you know, obviously, everybody's got their own take on what that would look like. And they're encouraging uh, time out to talk about non-work related stuff. Um, stuff that probably, I guess, typically we would be doing it as we're walking around the office and we're not doing it now. Um, I've seen mm. a lot of companies setting time aside for that. So this particular person doing that um, uh, and encouraging their teams, if they are working remotely, to, to get out of the house. You don't have yeah. to do that at lunch break. You can do it when you're needing it. And so maybe given the freedom to do that. Yeah. Um, and also the, the expectation that you may not be on call all the time. Being able to give that person the freedom to you know, turn the things off for a second and go out and have a walk. Um, can you think of anything else that if you were, if a company was putting that kind of first aid pack together for their team, any other suggestions you'd want to add to that? Yeah. So I would, I, I would have, it's difficult not to become dictatory if you're going to target things, but I would, I would specifically target things. One, one area we haven't necessarily covered is, is being active and, um, being active, yes, it has a really good physical element. So getting out and just into the fresh air, really, really good. But there, there's a certain amount of times that are optimal for certain people. Like if you're, if you're getting out and going for a walk, you only need 20 minutes a day in order for it to, to stimulate different things to protect your mental health. Right. So certainly if people are, are maybe unmotivated or apathetic a little bit at the moment, um, we, we've spoken to a lot of people who are finding that, that people are becoming more and more unmotivated, um, a bit apathetic, so they don't really care what's going on and quite flippant. Um, so one thing about being active is that it actually um, it, it, it develops. We've all got something in our, in our minds called or in our brains called the hippocampus. You've probably heard of it before. So the hippocampus is responsible for memory, it's responsible for learning, and it's responsible for a part of emotional intelligence called emotional regulation. So, um, you, Paul, you've probably been snappy before at somebody. Had a bit, had a bit of a short temper, I can imagine. Never. Now, so usually when you're stressed out and you know, when you've, you've got all this stuff, we become a bit snappy. So in order to regulate that, in order to me regulate our emotions and how we deal with the situations, uh, if we get 20 minutes of exercise a day, it spurs on something called, and increase, increases something called neurogenesis. So that is Im improving um, neurotransmitters, dopamine, oxytocin, uh, serotonin, which, which help with all of these different things. So that's why, where I said earlier on about having that green banner on the Thrive model as a consistent thing across businesses, that immediately, if people are getting that amount of... Um, that amount of well-being or that amount of those amount of protective factors in their working day then they're going to be much more resilient to cope with different things like that so you will have less arguments you'll have less people snapping out so for any any pack like that um what i would do is make it specific to the type of people so like we said about the the difference between sales teams and software engineers and how they need to connect with each other and that sort of thing I would also be quite specific on having walking meetings for everybody. Well, even if it's just on the phone, you know, not walking together, but, you know, making sure that you have a, a 20 minute walking meeting every day for everybody. And it's sort of targeted and it's kind of like a game and you can begin to do quite inventive things with it, but be specific um, and set minimums. Because one thing that we're going to see very soon is that the night's drawing and the issue is and why people get so impacted throughout winter um there's a higher increase for, for illness obviously but people's mood drops a lot and that's because there is less time in the day in order to perform your protective factors so you do everything. so if businesses can build them in they're going to have a much more consistent and a much more reliable workforce throughout that time Okay. I mean, just to just to build on the the 
the last question. I was thinking when it comes to encouraging being active is that being able to do something, you may not be able to do it as a team currently, yeah. um, being able to do something as part of a, a joint exercise, whether, you know, somebody, well, let's see if we can walk a hundred miles this week as a team. Yeah. Relays. That's yeah, what, yeah. Relay, that type of thing. So yeah, I think, I think as part of a toolbox, I think that's a great thing because everybody's doing things, something as a team and as a business, we do like teamwork. So uh, my last question actually just touches on what you were talking about just then and also earlier on about we have to have gone into lockdown during a really good summer and that's yeah. made, made a big difference. With, with the nights closing in and all that, um, how, would, how would we approach adjusting our well-being approach to our teams? So instead of like introducing something and we're going to run with this exactly same model 12 months of the year, week in, week out. How would we adjust it to compensate for those, those different seasonal things? Yeah, we, 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 we do need to. Um, there's a huge amount of, there's a huge amount of mental health issues or, or poor mental health that comes through, through winter. There's, there's a couple of um, clear reasons for that. If we're all in the UK and Ireland, then um you know we we don't exactly have the best sunlight so anyway so it, by by definition we are all um vitamin d deficient um don't run to the doctors and get vitamin d tested because you're going to be deficient anyway sure. but vitamin d has a massive impact on our mental health it's one of the primary causes of depression so if you don't have enough vitamin d within your body you can become depressed so in I can never remember if it's Switzerland or Sweden, but one of the countries have three months of, of darkness throughout the year. Um, Sweden, yeah. So suicide rates skyrocket throughout that time um, because people are, one of the reasons anyway, that people aren't getting the right amount of um, minerals and, and nutrition in their, in their body through the sunlight. So we all need it. So, the, one of the ways in which to combat that and to combat that risk is to open up uh, lunch times a little bit, yeah. for example. Allow people to get out when it is daylight um, so that you're encouraging people to get out of the house or get out of the office when it is actually daylight. Because if they're working into the evenings or they're working into oh, late, it gets where it gets, actually gets dark in the winter, like three o'clock or half two sometimes. They're not going to be able to get that when they finish work. So we need to start adjusting the times in which people have free in order to do their protective factors. So are, if you, are, you, doing that? are you doing that internally? We, yeah, I'm going to be doing it so that we have longer lunch breaks. So we're going to double the lunch breaks to two hours and people are going to work a bit later on in the evenings. So we work from, um, we work from half eight to half five anyway. Okay. Um, and we, well, people, people take as much lunch as they want really at the moment, but we do need to be a bit stricter with it. So we're going to open it up to, to two hours uh, through the winter months so that people have more time, especially with the way the gyms are and that sort of thing at the moment. If you want to pop to the gym, you know, a class is an hour. So that's your lunch break gone. If you want to have a shower and all of that sort of stuff, um, then you need to, you need to build in time around it. So it's like I said right at the beginning it's not the businesses it's not businesses responsibility to build a clinical understanding or be clinicians but it is part and parcel of the job to facilitate these things Absolutely. it will have a, a really good long-term impact so if you can you know facilitate people getting the, the relevant amount of sunlight during the winter and remain helping the protective factors remain consistent for the workforce um then that is you know that's that's the best bet of combating these different issues john i could sit and talk to you for hours and we have done on many occasions so um i'm probably going to pull it pull it to a close there um a big thank you huge thank you for giving up your time to do this um i know that you not only understand the kind of the business side of this but i think the human side of it as well and just how important this is um 
recommend everybody goes to the Arthur Ellis website. Can you just say the, the full website? Is yeah, it it's, uh, it's ArthurEllisMHS.com. Um, MHS for mental health support, not NHS, like we're trying to hijack anybody. <laughs> um, and people obviously can come and talk to you and um, um, pick your incredible brain as, um, even more. Um, but I think if we just call that a close, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. And um, oh, thank you this, very much. As, as Laura mentioned at the beginning, this is a recording. If anybody wants to kind of uh, play that back, it will be on the, the community hub part of the bit of website. Um, but I'll just say thank you very much. And I hope everybody enjoyed it. And I'm sure we'll be doing something again very soon. Thank you very much.